Uh, hello everybody. If you haven't met me here before or haven't heard from the introductions, my name is Miro Tsupag. I'm a software developer at DNA Stack. DNA Stack is a Toronto-based startup. We're building a cloud platform for genomics. And by the way, we are actively looking for Java developers. Uh, if anybody wants to work on cool and impactful things, come talk to me after. Um, our platform is written uh, primarily in Java, so we started looking into what's new in Java 9, and I thought it would be interesting to share some of this information. So the goal of this talk is to essentially go through an opinionated list of my favorite APIs in Java 9. So we'll take a look at uh, enhancements to four existing APIs, which is convenience factory methods for collections, uh, our beloved optional stream and completable feature. And we'll also take a look at four new APIs in Java 9, which is uh, Stackwalker, the new process handle API, HTTP to client, and JShell. And all the examples are going to be demonstrated using JShell. Uh, hopefully, we have, we'll have some time at the end to also have a look at the API. And for each of these APIs, I want to show what the situation was like prior to Java 9 and how things changed and how we can do things differently in Java 9. And that's as far as I'm going to go with slides. Um, the rest of this talk is going to take place in my terminal. So let me just switch here. Is this, is the font big enough? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm having some... Uh, Okay, um, so we, before we get to the actual APIs, uh, let me just say a few words about JShell, which is the tool that you're seeing here. So JShell is a new tool in JDK 9, and it's basically Java's implementation of REPL, read, eval, print loop. So it's a tool that continuously loops, reads your input, evaluates it, and prints out the output. So it's very similar to the kind of common line interface as you know it from other languages or stacks, Python, Groovy, Scala, they have all had that for a while. And finally, Java is getting an official REPL too. Uh, REPL is particularly good when you're new to the language and you're just trying to learn Java, but it can be also useful if you're an experienced developer and you just need to try something very quickly. So it's good for prototyping or exploring new APIs, or if you've worked on you know, some other project in Python and you're coming back to Java and need a reminder of how things work, uh, scenarios like that. And uh, the tool is very easy to figure out, so I think better than uh, explaining what it actually does, uh, we can just dive in and write some code and just see how that goes. So the first uh, API on our list are the convenience factor methods for collections. Java 9 makes it really easy um, to create small immutable collections, which is something that was uh, relatively tedious to do in previous releases. And we're all Java developers here, so I'm sure that everybody knows the drill. If I wanted to create, uh, let's say, a set, I would have to do something like this. Let's say I'm going to create a set of strings. And let's call it a set. Then I would add a couple of elements. Let's say A, B, C. And then to make it immutable, I would wrap it in an unmodifiable set. Uh, so we can see uh, a couple of things here. Maybe let me explain a couple of shortcuts that I'll be using uh, throughout this talk. So the main thing that you should know about JShell is that it accepts two types of inputs. So there's snippets, there's the Java code that you need to evaluate, which is what I've just typed here. But there's also commands to the actual JShell tool, which always start with a slash. And we'll see a few of these. So uh, before we get to this API, let me start with something simple, actually. I'm just going to type 1 plus 1. And you can see two interesting things here. 1 plus 1 was evaluated to 2, and 2 was assigned to something called $6 here. And $6 is an implicit variable that JShell created for me. And it does that whenever you have an expression that you don't assign to anything. Uh, I could have, of course, created my own variable. I could have done something like this, create the variable x. Uh, JShell has a couple of shortcuts. You've seen me use the first one here. That's shift, tab, and v means infer the type of variable from an expression and introduce a new variable of the type. 
uh, there's also uh, standard tab completion. If I wanted to print out this variable, I can just use this extensively here. Let's say something like this, and you can see that it's two. There's also a couple of sort of syntactic simplifications. So you can see that I need to, didn't need to wrap the expression in anything. It just got evaluated as it was. I didn't need to put a semicolon at the end of my statement. And I also wouldn't need to worry about catching checked exceptions, which can be useful for just quick prototyping. So if I wanted to put this thread to sleep, for example, uh, this throws an interrupted exception, which is a checked exception, I wouldn't actually need to catch it. I can just do it like this, and it's going to go through. So this brings us to the first command, and that's the command vars, which lists all the variables uh, that I've declared. Similarly, uh, I can also write methods and classes in JShell, and there's respective commands for that. So methods and types, but I don't really have any at this point. And there's also a command list that lists all the snippets that I've used before. Um, JShell has this uh, prefix matching going on. So as long as you specify a unique prefix of a command, it's actually going to find it correctly. So I could have just done something like this. And the last thing you should know is that there's also a help command, which just, just tells you everything that you can do within JShell. But let's get back to the first API, which were uh, convenience vector methods for collections. So the old way, you could see that it was pretty verbose. I needed five commands to create a very simple list. Uh, and that's not ideal. And the fact that it's not a one-liner can be a bit annoying. For example, if I have a static variable, I need to use a static initializer block uh, and things like that. It's also uh, pretty expensive. So th the set uh, that I created there was not really immutable. It was more like an immutable view of the underlying set. So I could still modify it if I kept the reference to it, which I did, in fact. Uh, and there's performance overhead associated with supporting mutability, not to mention all the extra objects that I had to create there. There are a couple of other ways of doing this uh, in previous versions of Java. You could pipe it through arrays at li as list or through stream or something like that. And they address the verbosity, but they have their own set of issues, mostly around performance and flexibility. But in Java 9, we can actually create truly immutable collections uh, very easily. I can just use the off method on any of the main interfaces, so list, set, and map. And you can see that it's overloaded quite a few times. There's 12 versions, to be exact. So it's always 0 to 10 elements. And then there's a varag method for more. And the reason it's done this way is because there's performance overhead associated with allocating the array to back up the varag. So if you're creating reasonably small collections, uh, which presumably is the vast majority of use cases, you want to avoid this penalty. So I wanted to create a simple list. I could just do something like this. And let's call it a list. And it, it really is immutable. If I try to add something here, it's actually going to fail with unsupported operation exception. And similarly, if I try to extract the class, it's going to tell me that this is immutable. And an interesting thing to note here, this is not your standard array list. This is a very special implementation of a list. And all these immutable collections, uh, they're not a part of the public API. So you can only rely on the interfaces here. And the methods to create those, they're static methods on interfaces, which means that they're not inherited, so you cannot invoke them from an implementing class, which means that this, what I have here, is pretty much the only way to create such a list, which is a nice design pattern that I thought would be worth pointing out. So the API for a set uh, is basically the same. Again, 12 methods, 0 to 10 arguments, uh, and varks. For a map, it's a bit different. For a map, and you can't actually see it here really well because it's too big. But there's 11 methods here. It's uh, 0 to 10 arguments, and there's no arg method. Or in this case, it's actually 20 arguments because you always specify key value sort of one after another. Uh, the reason there's no varag method is because keys and values can have two different types, and you cannot have two varags in a single method. So what they did is they actually provided a separate method here, uh, which is called, and cannot type here. Interesting. Not sure what I did here, actually. OK. Here we go. So there's a separate method of entries, which takes a single var of type map entry. 
So if I wanted to use this, I can just create a map like this. And I have a map where the key is integer and value is a string. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's just a really nice convenience feature. So collections uh, work very nicely uh, with the Streams API. And Streams API also learned a few new tricks. There's three methods that I would like to talk about uh, that I think are really interesting. The first one uh, actually consists of two methods, and it's take while and job while. So just as a reminder, what we had available in Java 8, we could create streams of arbitrary elements. I'm just going to do a simple in stream. And I would just create a stream of a number 0 through 9. So that's exclusive here. And I will print those. Actually, I'm just going to use a method reference here. So we have numbers 0 through 9. What we also had available in Java 8 were methods limit and skip. So if I wanted to take the first five elements of this stream, I could just do something like this. And complementary method, skip, something like this. And this was nice. Um, but the problem with this approach is that you need to know this number in advance, which sometimes is not the case. Sometimes you know that you want to keep taking elements while they're matches under certain condition, but you don't necessarily know how many there are. And that's exactly the functionality that was introduced in Java 9. So in Java 9, I can use take while or drop while. Uh, for example, like this, I can just tell it, OK, take everything that's less than 5, or complementary method, drop while. So they're kind of like versions of limit and skip that take a predicate instead of an absolute value. Another really interesting new method in the streams API is the method iterate. So if you take a look here, you can see that it's overloaded. There's two versions of it. The first one was available in Java 8. Uh, the second one was added in Java 9. And the difference between them is this predicate here. So let's just take a simple example to illustrate the difference. Uh, let's say I want to print all the even numbers that are less than 100, for example. A very, very straightforward and naive way of doing this in, uh, in Java 9, or in Java 8, actually, could be something like this. I would start with 0 uh, in every step, increment by 2, and then I would filter the numbers that are less than 100. And then I will just print them. And you can see that this kind of worked for a while, but not really. And it's, it's very easy to introduce a bug like this. Uh, what I've done here is I actually created an infinite stream. And I did filter the first 100 elements, but the stream kept going, and the integer went over at some point, and suddenly all my integers were less than 100. Uh, and there wasn't really a good way of dealing, with, of dealing with this in Java 8. But in Java 9, they added this predicate here. So I can replace this filter with just the condition here. And you can see that this works just fine. So it's a really nice kind of convenience feature. And if you look at it, it reads like a four cycle. And that's basically what it is. It's like a streamified version of four. The last method <coughs> in this API that I wanted to talk about is a method called off nullable. So in Java 8, we could create streams of arbitrary elements. So I could do something like this. This gives me a stream that contains a single element, and that's one. What I couldn't do is something like this. And that makes sense, because you don't want to have nulls in your streams. What I can do in Java 9, however, is call the method of nullable. And that actually gets processed correctly and creates a stream. But if I take a look at it, it's actually an empty stream. So not a stream that would contain null, but an empty stream. And that, again, is, is a nice kind of convenience feature that makes your code a tiny bit cleaner. Um, it's especially useful if you're writing long streams and you have a, a bunch of maps. Then at some point, usually, you end up with nulls and you need to filter them out, which means that you either have to have a block with an if statement or a ternary operator, and none of them are nice. So this allows you to get rid of that null check and just kind of have a nicer and cleaner streams. Um, a useful API that uh, plays very nicely with streams and actually was used to make uh, the stream API more robust uh, is optional. 
So optional is a container that may or may not contain a value. It was introduced basically to reduce the number of null pointer exceptions that can be found in your code. And it was introduced in Java 9. The basic API is really simple. I can create an empty optional, or I can create an optional that contains something. And what I also had available in Java 8 was a method called if present. And if present checks if there's a value in an optional, and uh, if there is a value, it allows us to apply an action to, to this value. So I can do something like this. And if I actually create an empty optional, this, of course, wouldn't be called. So that's Java 8 stuff. Java 9 added three methods, uh, three interesting methods that all have something to do with default values. So the first method on the list is if present or else. And that essentially works as if present, but it also allows you to specify a default action if the item is not present in the optional. So I can just rewrite it like this, and I will keep the original action for when the value is there. Otherwise, I can just print something else. I will just print this is empty. So you can see that this works nicely like this. And another method that's also related to, to default values is uh, the method or. And th this one is a bit tricky to explain uh, in a way that would make you appreciate it. Because what it does is essentially it takes a look at the value in an optional. If there is a value, it just returns the same optional. And otherwise, it returns whatever optional you give it. So I, I think it's best explained by comparing it to other methods that we had in Java 8. So in Java 8, we had two interesting ones. And those were uh, or else or, or, uh, or else get. So I'll just create an empty optional here called or else. <clears throat> and what or else does, it essentially looks in the optional. Is there a value? OK, return it. Is, there is no value. Just return whatever value I give it here. So in this case, empty. Or else get is essentially the same, but instead of a value, it takes uh, a supplier. So I can do something like this. So it's a tiny bit more flexible. But what these two methods have in common is that they both return the value that's inside the optional. So what or method does differently, it returns an optional. So I can rewrite this like this. So this gives me an optional. Um, and w when this is useful, it's uh, basically in a scenario when you want to make sure, make sure that you always have optionals. So particularly when you use it with streams and so sort of have many chain operations and you want to make sure that you're processing everything the same way, then this could be a nice, uh, useful utility method. The last method I wanted to mention here is the method stream. And stream uh, converts an optional to a stream. So I will just start with an empty one here. I will convert it to a stream, and then I will try to print out all the elements. And of course, it's empty, so this doesn't get called. If I had something in this optional, this would get converted to a stream that contains one element, and that's the value. And this also is kind of maybe tricky to appreciate unless you really start working with this. And it's also useful when, you're connect, when you connect this with streams. So we have streams of optionals, then this kind of allows you to convert between the two. So you basically get the benefit of the laziness of streams with your optionals. So in a way, this is similar to off nullable from the streams API that we've seen before in that how it behaves. So the next API that was also introduced uh, in Java 8 is uh, Completable Future. And Completable Future is basically uh, a framework for asynchronous programming in Java. So it's all kind of built around the class called Completable Future, which, as the name would suggest, is a future that can be explicitly completed. So you can set its status and a value. So what, what you typically use this for is to model a task in a computation that consists of many asynchronous tasks. And there are APIs for chaining completable futures and creating dependencies between them. The basic API, as it was introduced in Java 8, is actually really simple. 
uh, I can just create new completable future here. Uh, let's say a future of string. And let's call it CF. And then I can complete it, which takes a value. In my case, this is a string. So I'll just say this is done. And then if I try to extract the value, it's going to return the value that it completed with. So what happens if I don't complete it? Let me just reinitialize this here, and I can just call the get method directly. And you can see that it's blocking. It's going to keep blocking until somebody else completes the future from a different thread. So that's kind of how you synchronize things using this construct. Aside from completing a future normally, you can also complete it exceptionally. So I can call complete exceptionally here, and this takes uh, a throwable. So I'll just give it, let's say, a new illegal state exception. And then if I try to extract the value, it's going to fail with the exception that I gave it. So these are the two ways of completing futures, is normally or exceptionally. Java 9 introduced, well, quite a few things, actually. Uh, completable future is a pretty large class, almost 3,000 lines of code. And there are quite a few methods, uh, and quite a few public methods as well. And many of these were actually introduced uh, in Java 9. Most of them are not very exciting. Uh, I would say they're utility methods. There's a couple of factory methods, a few methods that make it easier to subclass completable future. but uh, Nothing too amazing. There are, however, three methods that I'm really excited about. Um, Java 9 introduced essentially a new way of completing completable futures, and it's based on a timeout. So if I just reinitialize this here, I can call the complete on timeout method, which uh, takes a value, let's say timed out, and it takes time. So I'll just say five seconds. So what this does, uh, it essentially creates a future. It's going to wait for five seconds. If somebody completes it, OK. If nobody completes it, it's going to be auto-completed with this value that I give it. So I can just try it out here. You can see it's not completed yet. Now it's completed normally. If I extract the value, it's timed out. So we can complete a future normally based on a timeout. But you can also complete it exceptionally based on a timeout. That's what the method OR is for. So let me just reinitialize this here. It's OR, and this takes time. So I'll just give it the same thing. And there is a typo. Oh, for timeout. Not completed yet. Finally, completed exceptionally. If I try to extract the value, it fails with a timeout exception. So you can complete the futures both normally and exceptionally based on a timeout. The last method here uh, that is really exciting is the method copy. And copy allows you to essentially create a defensive copy of a future. So this is useful for scenarios where you're designing a synchronous API that actually returns completable futures. In this case, you want to provide sort of one-way synchronization. So you want the client to be able to take the future and respond to it, chain more, more actions onto it. But you don't want them to be able to write into the future that you're using internally behind the API. Uh, and that's essentially what the copy method allows us to do. So let me demonstrate this here. I will just reinitialize my original future. I will create a copy. Let's call it a copy. And you can see that the original is not completed. The copy is not completed either. I can now complete the original. So this one is done. And now the copy is completed as well. And if I try to extract the value, it's actually what I gave to the original. So the client can respond to changes in the completable future behind the API. So let's try to do this the other way around. I will reinitialize the original, reinitialize the copy, and now I will complete the copy. So the copy is done, but the original is still not completed. So the client cannot write back. And that's a pretty cool feature. I think this is going to be really useful. So 
so I think uh, that's enough uh, as far as sort of minor modifications to existing APIs are concerned. Uh, let's take a look at some of the new APIs uh, in Java 9. And the first one on the list is uh, Stackwalker. So Stackwalker gives us a really easy, lazy, and stream-friendly way of accessing stack traces. So what we had available prior to Java 9, since Java 1.4, I think, uh, was the method get stack trace. So I could create a throwable and then call get stack trace, which gives me an array of stack trace elements. So if I try to print this here, this is my stack trace at this point in time. Now, there are a couple of issues with this. Um, number one, this is very expensive. So the, the JVM needs to capture the entire stack eagerly. So even if I only need access to the first few elements, I still need to process the entire stack. There are no convenience methods for things like filtering or <coughs> obtaining uh, references to the class instances of the classes declaring the methods. And on top of that, there's not even a guarantee that I'm getting the full stack trace. The specification says that JVM is allowed to omit certain elements for performance reasons. So if that's something that you're relying on, then you're basically out of luck. But the new Stackwalker API addresses all these issues. And it's actually very simple to use. I can just obtain an instance of the Stackwalker and call the main method there, which is the method walk. And the method walk allows me to essentially manage stack traces as streams. So I can just do something like this, call the collect method on streams, collect this, let's say, into a list. And this is my stack trace. So it's very similar to what I got from the get stack trace method. This approach, however, allows me to take advantage of the streams functionality. So if I was only interested in stack trace of depth three, for example, I could just use the limit method here, which we're already familiar with. And these would be the top three elements of my stack trace. I can also easily get access to the actual class instances. I can just, I'm actually going to remove the limit method here. I can just tell the stack walker to uh, retain references to the classes, and then I can extract that information through something like a map. So just say, for each frame, give me the declaring class, and just run it like this. So these are all the classes involved in my stack. <clears throat> and again, I can take advantage of the streams API. So if I was only interested in, let's say, the util class here, I can just uh, filter for this class. So just add a filter here. And for each class, filter the classes where they're equal to this one. And you can see that there are two matches. So kind of a nice uh, little API that's been added in Java 9. Uh, another API that I'm actually really excited about, and I think that's probably the most underrated feature in Java 9, is the new process API. Um, the new process API allows us to get more information about running processes. So what we had available um, prior to Java 9, since Java 1.5, was the Process Builder API that allowed us to launch external processes. So if I wanted to find the, the list of Java processes running in my system, I would do something like this. I would create a Process Builder here, give it a command JPS, which lists Java processes, and then just start it, and this works. The major limitation of this API is that I cannot really extract any information about the process, even really simple things such as the PID. This is available in Java 9, but it wasn't really available before. So what people ended up doing is either using JMX, which is very hacky, or they would write their own utilities to get this information, which typically involved calling something like PS and grab, and they would kind of get the information about the process from the outside, which is unnecessary work. It's not portable, error prone, so it's just not something that you should have to worry about. Especially nowadays, in a polyglot world, you know, when you have microservices that often take care of some underlying process written in a different language, or you, know, you have various automation tools that need to manage processes and things like that, it's very useful to have this as part of the JDK. So the new API is built around a class called uh, Process Handle. And Process Handle is actually an interface uh, allows us to do a bunch of things. I can obtain a handle to my current process and let's say extract the PID. I can extract various other information as well. This gives me a bunch of things. And there are 
sort of convenience methods for extracting various different aspects uh, of this information. So I can, for example, call the method command line, which I personally feel is going to be really widely used and really useful. And this gives you information about how your Java application was started, including all the arguments. Mm, you can also. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, you can also get information about other processes uh, running in the system, everything that's visible to me. So I could, for example, do something like this, all processes, which gives me a stream. And then I could apply a map to extract certain information from my process. Let's say info and command. And then I will just collect these. And this gives me a list of uh, all the commands that are running in my operating system right now. Another really useful method here that's probably going to be very widely used is the method called onExit. And that allows us to trigger an action when an external process completes. So for example, let's say I want to start something with a predictable runtime. I'll, I'll just call sleep. So I'll do a new process builder here, give it a command sleep tell it to sleep for three seconds, let's say, and then I can start it, immediately get a handle to it, and call on exit, which gives me a completable future. And we already know a completable future API. I can call something like then accept, and I will print something. I'll, I'll just print the, the whole process handle here. So the two-string method on that is the PID. So what we're expecting to happen here a process is started asynchronously. Three seconds later, its PID is going to be printed, the PID of the now deceased process. So we can try this out here. Synchronous, it returned. Three seconds later, there's the PID. So really nice uh, little feature. And I don't need to limit myself to management of individual processes. I can create the whole pipelines uh, in the sense of Unix pipelines, where you connect the output of a previous process to the input of the, ne of the next process. So if I wanted to, let's say, list all the Java processes and find JShell there, I could do it like this. I will create a process builder, tell it to call my favorite JPS, and let's call this JPS. And then I would create another process for grep and grep for JShell. Let's call this grep. And finally, I will start a pipeline, which takes a list of process builders. So I can take advantage of the new convenience factory methods here. I'll just do a quick list here, give it JPS and grab, and call this a pipeline. So now it's synchronous, so process is not finished yet. If I take a look at a bit later, you can see that I finished successfully, return value zero. So now I can try and take a look at what I actually found. So in order to do that, I would first need to get access to the last process in my pipeline, which is index 1. And then I can get the input stream to its output. Then I need to do standard Java input stream boilerplate. I will wrap it in an input stream reader. And I would wrap this in a buffer reader. And then I can call the method read line. And you can see that I found the process. It's this PID, and it's called JShell Tool Provider, which is the process that actually launches JShell. So you can see how this is a really powerful API. It's not something you would want to implement yourself, especially not in a way that would work across all the different platforms. So I'm personally really excited about having this as part of the JDK. Now, the last, last big API that I wanted to show here is the new HTTP2 client. And uh, that's actually really exciting. So the new HTTP2 client not only provides a much nicer, much cleaner API to the old HTTP raw connection, but it supports all, all the cool new things. It supports HTTP2 over TLS, uh, WebSockets, and just all the things that you would expect, server push, proxies, uh, basic authentication, asynchronous requests, uh, all stuff like that. So this is actually delivered as an incubator module in Java 9, which means that it's uh, not completely finalized. 
Uh, it lives in a special namespace and it's not resolved by default, but I pre-imported it into JShell so that we can work with it. So <clears throat> in order to demonstrate the client API, I'm going to need a server. And if there's anything that we know about the internet and live demos, it's that you cannot trust this pair. So I'm just going to write a simple server here. Um, and I actually really like this example because I think that's something that people assume is going to be really complex in a language like Java or it require a lot of boilerplate. But it's actually really easy to do just using functionality that's available in the JDK. And these are just really old APIs that have been around for a very long time. So I will create the simplest possible server here. <clears throat> I will just give it a single endpoint. Uh, and on that endpoint, no matter what the request is, I'm going to respond with a fixed string. So let's start by defining a handler for this endpoint. So create an HTTP handler called handler, and this takes an HTTP exchange and does a lambda. And in that lambda, I will define the string I want to return. Let's call it body. Let's say, hello, tjuk. I will, <clears throat> I will set uh, the response headers. I will always respond with 200. Everything is OK. And attach the length of the string here. And finally, I will write the string to the actual body of the response. So I will open an output stream here, assign uh, the response body, and there's too many break. No, it's fine. And then I will write the actual string. And this is an old API, so I need to do this through get bytes, but that's OK. And finally, just close everything. So we take a look here. This is how our handler looks OK. So let's create the server. Uh, I will create a server here, and this needs a port. So I will just give it let's say uh, 8,000 and don't need the backlog. Let's call this HS. Then I will create my endpoint. Let's say slash hello and attach my favorite handler to it. And finally, I can start the server. Now, hopefully, the server is running. And to test that, I'm going to first create a simple client using the old HTTP URL connection API, and then we'll compare it to the new HTTP client. So in the old API, I would start by creating a new URI that points to my local server, which is HTTP localhost, I think I used 8000 slash hello. Um, let's call this URI. Then I would convert this URI to a URL so that I can open the connection. And I will open the connection here. And this actually returns a URL connection, which is not what I want. I want an HTTP URL connection. And the, the reason this works like this is because it's a really old API, and it was designed with multiple protocols in mind, uh, even though eventually HTTP is realistically probably the only one that ended up being used. Uh, but unfortunately, I will need to cast this to an HTTP URL connection. So we can see that I'm just starting out here, and this API is already super ugly. And I need to set the request method here. I will just do a simple get, which again is passed as a string, very ugly. And finally, I can see if this works, and I can try and extract the response code. So fingers crossed, and it's 200. This is looking good. But let's try to extract the actual body of the response as well. So to do that, again, something that we're familiar with, get an input stream on the connection, and the whole Java boilerplate input stream reader, wrap this in a buffered reader, and finally, call the read line method. And you can see it says, hello, TJuk. So now both the server and the client are working, but it was pretty ugly to get there. So let's try to do the same thing with the new HTTP client. And the new API is actually built around three classes. There's HTTP client, HTTP request, and HTTP response. So let's start with the client here. I will just create a new HTTP client. Let's call it a client. 
if I actually take a look at the version here, it's going to say that it's HTTP2. Even though, to be fair, I'm not really taking advantage of this. I'm only talking to my local server, so it doesn't really matter. But we're using this to demonstrate the API, so, so it's fine. So now I will create the HTTP request, uh, which uses a builder pattern. So I'll obtain the builder, uh, give it my URI from before, call the get method nicely as a method, and then build. Let's call this a request. And then I can use the client to send the request to the server. And this also takes something called a uh, body handler here. In this case, I'm just going to tell it to treat everything as a string. And thankfully, there's a built-in handler for this. So I'll just use the string handler here. And let's call this response. And now, to extract the status code, it's as simple as calling the status code method to extract uh, the body, it's as simple as calling the body method. So it's just really nice, way cleaner than the old API. Um, it also doesn't have that many side effects, which was a major complaint uh, against the old HTTP URL connection API. And it's very flexible too. If I wanted to make this asynchronous, for example, I can just change this to send async. And this returns completable future, of course. So I will just call the response. and. Oh yeah, that's good actually. And now I can get the value from the completable future, call the body. Here I have a nice asynchronous request. So that's pretty cool. They also have a really nice API around handling HTTPS, so certificate management and all of that. But that's uh, definitely beyond the scope of this talk. So the last thing um, that I wanted to show is uh, basically that JShell is not just a tool but there's also an API behind it. So if you wanted to have this kind of functionality in your application, you can code against the API. And I don't want to get into too much detail, but if you were about to look into that, the place to start would be the class called JShell. So I can create a JShell here. So now I have a JShell in my JShell, a bit of an inception thing going on here. So let's just try and close this talk with the first thing that we used when we started this talk, and that was a simple one plus one example. So I'll just use my embedded inner J shell here, call the method eval, and give it my expression, one plus one. This gives me a list of snippet events. And now I can convert these to a stream and extract the value. So for each snippet, give me, give me the value. And I'll just I'll just print it. And you can see that it's true. And uh, that's pretty much it. This has been a list of my favorite APIs. Um, I don't know if uh, usually the slides are distributed or anything. I don't really have any. But what I can do is uh, save the session here. Uh, and I can post it somewhere or Twitter or wherever. Uh, this is my Twitter handle here. Uh, I will post this later. I also have a couple of blog posts that I started recently about Java 9 that get into a lot more detail uh, than this, if you want to check that out. And otherwise, thanks, and hopefully that was useful. <laughs>